Hello, welcome back to Algebra. The title of this section is called Quadratic Systems of Equations. Now it sounds very, very complex, but actually it's not at all hard to understand what's going on here. What we're going to do in this lesson is give an overview of what a quadratic system really is. We're going to draw lots of pictures in this lesson. We're not going to have any, hardly any equations, certainly no difficult problems to solve. This is a concept lesson. And we're going to understand the concept here, and then in the next lesson I'm going to show you how to solve quadratic systems by the techniques that we'll learn in the next lesson. So the next lesson will be a lot more math. This lesson will be a lot more pictures, which is fun sometimes to make sure you understand the concepts. Now, if you remember back, we already talked about what a system of equations is, but in the past we called it a system of linear equations. Linear is the word there in the past that we use. Linear means line. So when you have a system of linear equations, it means you have more than one, usually we were talking about two, lines. And the system is basically the solution of that system is where the lines cross. If the lines have a, a crossing point, they're only going to be one crossing point, and that intersection point common to both lines is what we call the solution. So there's one solution if there's one crossing point. But you all know that lines can also be parallel where they never intersect at all, in that case we say that there is no solution of that linear system of equations. So we've done all that in the past. But now that we have under our belt the conic sections, we have circles and parabolas and ellipses and hyperbolas, and we also have lines that we can graph also. So we can have systems of equations that involve these quadratic functions. Quadratic just means it has a square term. And, and of course, you know all the circles and ellipses, they have x squares and y squares everywhere, so all of those, we call them conic sections, they're also quadratic in nature because they have squares running around the variables. All right. So the bottom line is we now have systems of equations called quadratic systems where we graph more than one conic section like a circle and an ellipse or a circle and a hyperbola or a parabola and a, a, a circle or something like this and we're looking to solve by finding those intersection points from among those uh, quadratic equations, among those uh, ellipses, hyperbolas and so on. Also we can have lines thrown in there. So we can have you know, no intersection points, or one, or two, or three, up to four intersection points. So now we need to start to draw pictures, because it's actually very easy to understand. So let's recall things that we already know. We already know that there's this thing called a line out there, right? What is the general equation of a line? Of course I could give you the, the, the most general version, but I'm just talking about giving an example of a line. Well, a line might be something like y is equal to 3x plus 2. How do you know it's a line? Well, because the x term does not have a square or any other higher power, so it has to be a line. Same with the y. If the x and the y variable don't have any squares or higher powers, then it has to be pretty much be a line. All right? So this is some line. This is the y-intercept. This is the slope. Now, I'm not going to graph this, this line. That's going to take too much time. But in general, lines can have, uh, they can have slants up and to the right like this. They can have slants down. Uh, and down and to the right like this. So this is a positive slope line, this is a negative slope line, right? And um, you can also, of course, have you know, horizontal lines, you can have vertical lines, right? So that is what we studied in the past. When we had two of those lines graphed on the same graph paper, we called it a system of linear equations, and we were looking for the intersection points. But now we have a much richer uh, set of, of uh, uh, conic sections that we know how to talk about. The first one, let's talk about a parabola. Just reminding you what we've already learned. What would be an example equation of a parabola? You know, it might be something like y is equal to 3 parentheses x minus 2 quantity squared. How do you know it's a parabola? Well, because the x term is the one that's squared and the y term isn't. That pretty much always means it's going to be a parabola. The shift in here tells you where the center or the vertex is going to be. There's no shift in y, and this tells you if it's open, up, or down. Now, as you know, when you graph these parabolas, because we've done it so many times, you might have a parabola that goes down and up like this, or you might have a parabola that opens upside down, so a smiley face or a frowny face. In general, those are the shapes of the parabolas that we care about. Okay, and then, of course, we, all, we also know that we can have uh, parabolas left and right, uh, also, I'm not, I haven't drawn those. That's if the y term is squared, but the x term is not squared. We've studied those in the past as well. All right. So for the simplest case of a circle, what does that look like? Just give a simple equation of a circle, right? You might have something like x squared plus y plus 4 quantity squared is equal to 4. So it's the x term that's squared and the y term that's squared. Then it's either going to be a circle or 
a uh, an ellipse. It's going to be a circle or an ellipse, and the, sh the, the form of an ellipse looks slightly different, so we know that this is a, a circle. The radius is equal to 2, the square root of the right-hand side. This is the shift in the center, and the shift on the x direction, has no. there's no shift at all. But in general, what does a circle look like? Again, not drawing a, a real graph of this, but a circle looks like a circle. And of course, we can move all of these all over the xy plane, depending on with the shifting values that we have. All right, so let's crank along here. After a circle, we studied an ellipse, which as you know, is very similar to a circle. It's just a stretched version of that. So an example of an equation of an ellipse might be x plus three quantity squared over four plus y minus three quantity squared over two is equal to one. How do you know it's an ellipse? Well, you have an x squared term plus a y squared term, but you have numbers on the bottom that determine how it's stretched in the x and the y direction, and the right-hand side is equal to 1. And we've studied many, many ellipses, and, and the shift in the x direction and the y direction is read directly off of the graph like this. So what can an ellipse more or less look like? Well, we've studied the fact that you can have horizontal ellipses, right? And you can also have vertically oriented ellipses, and it all depends on the numbers that are on the bottom here. So you see, I'm drawing all these because I want to remind you all the different shapes we have to play around with because when we have our quadratic systems, we're going to mix them all together. Now, the last one we have that we've studied is the hyperbola. What does the general equation of a hyperbola look like? All right. Well, it might look something like x minus 4 quantity squared over 2 minus y plus 3 quantity squared over 4 is equal to 1. How do we know this is a hyperbola, not uh, an ellipse? Well, it's because there's a minus sign here. It still has an x squared term and a y squared term, but it's linked with a minus sign, whereas the ellipse is linked with a plus sign. The numbers on the bottom determine the asymptotes, which kind of helps us sketch the thing, but more or less, what does this thing look like? We said hyperbolas can look kind of like this, horizontal versions of the hyperbola, or we could have vertical versions of the hyperbola as well. The center of the hyperbola is right between the two curves. All right, so take a look at what we have on the board. We have lines, we have parabolas, we have circles, we have ellipses, and we have hyperbolas, right? So those are all the conic se sections. Of course, a line is not a con conic section, but we can still use, we, we still have systems of equations that involve lines as well, so we just throw it in there, all right? So a linear set of equations is just equations of lines. We've learned how to solve them. We said we can solve them graphically. That's when you graph them and look for the intersection point. You can use addition and you can use substitution. So in this lesson, we're not doing any of that stuff. We're just sketching some things to show you how you can have a different number of solutions. A quadratic system can have, uh, let me go ahead and write that down actually, quadratic system, which means a system that involves one of these, uh, two of these uh, equations that we've written on the board there. It can have for solutions, it can have zero, one, two, three, or up to four solutions. Now, when I talk about solutions, I'm talking about real solutions. So I'm gonna talk about real solutions, right? In this class, we're not gonna be focusing on imaginary solutions of systems of equations. We're just not gonna talk about that. If they intersect, we say that those are the real solutions, the actual intersection points. If there's no intersection point, we're not discussing any imaginary solutions or anything else because that's beyond the scope of this class. So we're just looking at the intersection points. So let's go down a trip down memory lane here. Let's talk about some really, really simple cases. First of all, forget about the rest of the conic sections. Let's say we have two lines that are just lines and they cross like this. How many solutions are there to this? Well, there's one solution. Why? Because there's only one intersection point. The point here is common to both lines, so because it, is, it shares commonality with both, it satisfies both equations, and so because of that, it is a solution. Now, what if you have uh, a line like this and then a line parallel to it like this? So, you see, these lines never cross, so we say that we have zero solutions. It's very, very common when you solve a system of equations to not have any solution at all. It doesn't mean it's magical or mystical or what does that mean? It just means that the graphs don't cross. So there's no commonality between the two. So there's no solutions that satisfy both of the equations. Now let's crank up the complexity a little bit. Actually, none of this is hard, but uh, I want to make sure you really understand. What if you had, and we're just going to give some examples here. What if I had a circle, all right, and then a line that goes through 
the circle like this. How many solutions do I have here? So I could have an equation, a system of equations that has an equation of a circle might look something like this. And then right next to it, the other equation might be a line that looks like this. So if, if I were to plot them, I would see I have two intersection points, so there's two solutions. Whoops, solutions. If I were to graph them on a sheet on a graph paper, of course, I could figure out the intersection points by, gra by graphical methods. And I could, um, you know, go to town. However, I might have, um, let's draw a little dividing line here. I might have a circle with a line that never crosses it, like this. This is zero solutions. Right, zero solutions. Because there's no, just like there's no solutions here, there's no solutions here. Now, let me ask you this. You might think a line in a circle is always gonna have two, two solutions, but what if I have a special case where I have a circle like this, right? But then a line just, see if I can draw it, just grazes the surface right here, only at one location. If I took a microscope and zoomed into this thing, I would find that that line only touches the edge at one exact location because I can surely shift this line up and up and up and up till it just touches the surface in one place. That's called a tangent line, a line tangent to the circle. So if you only touch it in one location, there's only one point of commonality, there's only one solution. So you see, even in the case of the circle, you can have a circle and a line. You can have zero solutions. You can have one solution if it just touches the edge. And you can also have two solutions if it goes through the center, or not even through the center, just some goes through both sides of the circle like this. All right? Um, and then, of course, you can play around with the other possibility, too. That's just a circle and a line. But let's take a look at the possibilities for a parabola. Let's say I have a parabola. I've drawn it like this, but it could be flipped upside down. And I have a line that goes through like this, okay? So there's an intersection point here and here, so there's two solutions. If I can draw, I cannot draw a solution. Two solutions, right? But of course, I could have a, a, a different parabola, one maybe that goes upside down like this. And I could have a line that just touches the very tippy top of that parabola like this, only at one location, that could be one solution. This tangent line, I could draw it down here, just touching the parabola in one location. I can touch it here, touching it in one location. This parabola is curved all the time, so I can always find a line to just touching in one location. By the way, this concept of a tangent line, it's never going to go away. In fact, almost the whole subject of calculus, when you get into calculus, is all about tangent lines. I know you might think, well, who cares about tangent lines? It seems so, so completely worthless as a concept. But just trust me, when we get into calculus, you'll see the and understand the, necess the necessity of studying this stuff. Lines that are tangent to curves, it really does cover about half of calculus one. So kind of got to get used to the idea. So that's a, a, a parabola and a line. Um, and then, of course, we can have a parabola like this. And then we can have a line up here so there's no solution at all. So you can see the idea here. I could keep drawing things, and I do have a few more I do want to draw. But the bottom line is, I said that quadratic systems can have real solutions. It can have zero solutions, one solution, two solutions, three solutions, or even four solutions. And we've already seen on the board, we can have zero, we can have one, here's one with one, zero, two, and no solution. So we've already drawn quite a bit of possibilities already. But we have some more possibilities I'd like to draw for you. Um, just so that you, you know, I do the thinking kind of for you ahead of time. Let's draw something a little more complex. Let's say we have a circle that we have plotted and an ellipse that just cuts into that circle something like this. You see there's two intersection points, one right here and one right here. Solution. Two solutions, right? We can pick up the pace a little bit. What if I move that ellipse over to the right just a little bit so that it only touches at one location? Now, the way I drew this is not the best. It looks like I intersected, but I'm trying to draw it touching just in one location. That's a terrible ellipse, by the way. And this is only one solution. So you can see you can have one solution even in the case of ellipses and, um, and uh, circles. Okay, what if I have two ellipses? What if I have a horizontal ellipse that goes around like this, and then I, have, I can have a vertical ellipse that goes here? Now you can see that's how you get to your four solutions, right? Because I can have circular objects, meaning an ellipse is, is a circular kind of shape to it, even though it's stretched, and they can intersect in such a way that you can have four um, intersection points. Now let me ask you a question. Here's kind of a trick question you have to think about. So I can see how I can have one solution if, if the circle and the ellipse touch uh, in one location. I can have four solutions if they fully cross each other. How can I have a circle and an ellipse cross in only three locations? 
it actually takes a minute of you thinking about that. How can you have a circle and an ellipse intersect, but it only in three places? And it's kind of weird at first, but the way that can happen is something like this. I can have, for instance, a circle like this, and I can have an ellipse that looks something like this. It only goes and touches this border of the circle in one location, but then it comes up and crosses and of course that's a terrible ellipse, but you get the idea. It crosses one, two, and this is only touching in one location. A this is tangent right here, so this is three solutions. Okay? And then of course you can have special cases when you have two circles. I can have two circles just kissing each other and where they just touch in one location, so this is one solution. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit since we're we're getting the point of it here. I can have hyperbolas. I can have what happens when you have hyperbolas and lines and hyperbolas and circles. You can have all kinds of things. So I can have a hyperbola and I can have a line going through it, cutting in two locations, right? I can have a parabola, right? Plus a hyperbola, a parabola plus a hyperbola, I can have the hyperbola, let me draw the hyperbola in another color. I can have the hyperbola come in like this and the hyperbola come in like this. You see it crosses in, now it's not symmetric, it's not drawn properly, but you can see that you can have four crossing points, four solutions, right? So I can have two solutions for a line and a hyperbola, I can have four solutions for something like this, and actually I can have a, a parabola and hyperbola that actually only has three solutions as well. So I can actually draw the hyperbola, instead of drawing it just horizontally like this, I can draw the hyperbola like this if I want to. There's nothing saying I can. If you kind of tilt your head sideways, you can see the hyperbola comes in like this. It's just I've drawn it uh, in a different kind of direction, right? And I can have a, um, a uh, parabola come in and then down like this. So this is a parabola plus a hyperbola. I have one, two, three crossing points, three solutions, okay? And then there's only one more I'm going to do for you, and that is I can have an ellipse that could look something like this, and then I can have a hyperbola that comes in like this, and then the hyperbola doesn't even, the other side of the hyperbola doesn't even touch this guy, so there's two solutions here. All right, I could have simplified this entire lesson if I wanted to. I could have just said, hey guys, there's these things called conic sections, plus you know we have our lines. We can have what we call a quadratic system. We have at least two of these things plotted on one sheet of graph paper, and you can have uh, zero, one, two, three, or four crossing points, and I could have just left it at that, and, and that would have been fine. But I really like sketching a few because what's going to happen in the next lesson is we're going to start solving these systems, mathematically solving them. Sometimes you're going to get no solution. Sometimes you're going to get one solution. Sometimes you're going to get three. Sometimes you're going to get four. And if you don't have this in your mind, then you don't even know why you're getting different answers sometimes, right? But now you can see why, because it's just the physicalness of how the things are, are outlined, if you or how the things are graphed. If you were to take the problems in the next few lessons and graph them all, you would immediately see the crossing points. But we're not going to be graphing them in the next lesson. It, you know, when we learn system of equations the first time, the first thing we did is graph them to find the solutions. But you see how hard that would be for quadratic systems because, you, you know, we've sketched hyperbolas and parabolas. You, you can sketch them, of course, and you can see roughly how many there are, but if you wanted to get the exact values here, it's really hard to do on graph paper. I mean, you'd have to really plot a lot of points and get exact because the curving nature of it with lines, it's very simple. Everything's, you know, very easy to kind of line up so we can do it graphically, but for quadratic systems, graphical just doesn't get you anywhere. So in the next lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to solve these things by substitution, which we've also done for the linear equations, and we're also going to learn how to solve them by addition, which we've done uh, in, the, in the linear system uh, as well. So we're going to be using those techniques and we're going to be applying them to quadratic systems. Sometimes you're going to get zero, sometimes you're going to get one solution, sometimes you're going to get two solutions, sometimes three, sometimes four solutions. In the back of your mind, when those solutions pop out of your math, I want you to remember why they pop out that way, because of the physical nature and wh of whatever it is you're trying to solve. We're looking for the intersection points and those are going to yield the real solutions to the system. So follow me on to the next lesson and we're going to start conquering how to solve these quadratic systems mathematically.